webinar. Thank you once again for joining us. We will now begin today's session. Um, welcome back. <laughs> good morning, good afternoon, and good evening all. Once again, a very warm welcome on behalf of MYT. We very much look forward to supporting you with today's session, Geospatial Data Solutions for Improving Health Campaign Efficiency and Effectiveness. Um, we would like to open with a few housekeeping notes before handing over to Mark Levy. Please be aware that the sessions will be recorded. You will be able to view the recordings after the event via the Health Campaign Effectiveness Coalition website. Please familiarise yourself with the programme, speakers, attendees and networking opportunities available on the platform. All can be accessed from the navigation bar on the left hand side of the homepage. We would like to encourage interaction. Please use social media channels to promote and engage a wide audience with this event by tagging at HCE Coalition and using the hashtag collaborative action. During the session, please add your questions to the Zoom Q&A, which can be found at the bottom <laughs> Zoom taskbar. You'll be able to see the questions posted, upvote and add comments. We will aim to answer as many questions as possible during the sessions. And finally, the MYT team are here to help you with any technical difficulties. Please use the chat facility on Zoom or email the team at events at myt.uk.com. I am now delighted to hand over to Mark Levy to welcome you to this session. Thank you. Um, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, it's a real delight to be here. Um, we've been a fan of the the Health Campaign Effectiveness Coalition for some time, and it's it's a real delight to, to present here today. Um, and I'm especially delighted to have such a great set of, of panelists to communicate our messages. Um, so, sorry. Um, so Emily, if you could just move to the next, um, screen. My name is Mark Levy and I'm the director of Grid3. Um, and just to the next one. So everybody is pretty much aware of the value of spatial data for helping to solve a variety of delivery challenges. Um, but in practice, nobody ever has enough of the spatial data that they need. So we have a paradox. Um, you know, how come we're always short of the thing that we all say is so valuable? Um, Grid3 was created following the successful innovation of application of core spatial data in polio immunization campaigns in Northern Nigeria. And our donors, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and UK Aid said, see how far you can push it. Can you extend it to an entire country? Can you extend it to multiple types of campaigns? Can you extend it to other healthcare challenges? Can you extend it to other sectors? Um, and so that's what we've been doing the last 14 years. And my colleagues and I are going to tell you what we've learned. Um, we generalized from the approach taken in Northern Nigeria in, in this way. Um, we seek to find ways to add value rapidly and in a very big way um, uh, for um, a problem that's a very high priority within the country. And so this resets everyone's expectations about what's possible and how valuable it can be. Um, second, we do this work um, through a model of data partnerships. So there's no one party that has sole responsibility for producing any of the new data sets that we help governments work with, but we do this in 
the partnership between technical experts and government ministries and other stakeholders. And then finally, from the very beginning, we're worried about sustainability. And so we're looking for ways to embed all these processes in national institutions and workflows, and especially um, finding ways to get them reflected in sustainable ongoing financial operations. Um, next. The, the way that Grid3 has found to quickly add value um, at a reasonable cost is to focus on the items in this diagram. Uh, high resolution population data, um, accurate settlement maps, accurate and validated subnational boundaries, um, maps of health facilities and other relevant um, uh, infrastructure, and to focus on these things through three um, sets of activities, um, improving the way data is collected, making use of state-of-the-art data science to model data when it can't be collected directly, and to help people use the data effectively using the most effective innovations in, um, in uh, relevant applications. Uh, next. Um, so, and we're doing this at a time when we're able to take advantage of remarkable recent breakthroughs across all of these dimensions. Um, so as you'll learn very quickly, the, the data science around estimating population distribution has made huge advances just in the last few years. And so this has opened up a range of possibilities that was not available before. Um, in addition, the ability for the governments in Africa across the board to get access to accurate, up-to-date settlement maps that are derived from uh, very high-resolution commercial satellite imagery uh, processed through state-of-the-art machine learning on what we used to call supercomputers. These days, they're just called computers. Um, this is a brand new development that's also opened up uh, dramatic new possibilities that weren't present before. And you know, similar breakthroughs have been made available, have become available around handheld technology that's opened up how data is collected, how um, health delivery can be administered in ways that integrate spatial data and so on. So the, the reason that effort put into these things has been so powerful is is in large part because of these dramatic breakthroughs that we're able to bundle together to unleash a lot of value. Next. Um, and another reason that the work that goes into creating good core spatial data and helping people put it to use has been so powerful is that uh, we benefit strongly from what economists call positive externalities, which is, means that the more that people are using the products and services, the, the more valuable they become. Um, and so this is just, this is one illustration um, uh, in which work for the education ministry in Sierra Leone led to some analysis carried out by uh, our grid three colleagues, uh, Flowminder, um, in order to identify the populations that were out of reach of radio transmitters um, and therefore could not listen to educational programming broadcast over the radio. And then that led to a set of prioritized, optimized locations for new radio transmitters to help the ministry meet its education goals. Um, we now see similar um, analyses being done around immunization campaigns where people are starting to get interested in using the grid three data to identify populations that are out of reach of radio broadcasts and therefore cannot listen to um, vaccination uh, promotion campaigns and have to be reached through other means. Uh, next. 
Um, another way to talk about positive externalities is that the, the more people invest in these kind of data, the cheaper it becomes to get the next stage and the faster it is to get the next stage. Um, this is an illustration from the program to combat malaria in the Democratic Republic of Congo. Um, for a malaria control campaign funded by the Global Fund, IMA collected very detailed household level geospatial um, data across seven provinces, um, almost 4 million independent data points. Um, and so now, thanks to a data sharing agreement, um, Grid3 is starting to put those data to work for other purposes. Um, it turns out to be a very quick, effective, accurate way to generate uh, health area boundaries. Um, and it's also an excellent source of information for validating and improving the accuracy of the settlement mapping uh, methodologies and the population estimation methodologies. Next, um, capacity strengthening is at the core of everything we do. Um, the, what we have found to be successful is identifying the capacity needs at the outset and getting started on them right away. Um, the people tend to express their capacity needs not in terms of how they're going to implement the program that you came in to help design, but how to get their job done, uh, making use of spatial data expertise, for example. And so they can start doing that right away and they want to. And so we have found that if we do what we can to meet their spatial data capacity needs across the board, it works much better for everyone. Um, next. So in conclusion, the, the main lesson that we've learned from four years of picking up this challenge from our donors um, to see if we could extend the Northern Nigeria polio model across sectors, across countries, is that it does work. It definitely scales nationwide. And you'll, you'll hear about that from um, some of the panelists that are coming up. Um, it scales across different types of campaigns, different health delivery uses beyond the health sector. We have a lot of users in um, in education, for example, um, financial services, um, any kind of sector where somebody is trying to reach people in a particular place can benefit from these data. And it works in any country. Um, we've had success, um, you know, the depth of the success does vary, um, but we've worked successfully uh, with Somalia, South Sudan, um, there's, so far we have not found a place where it's impossible to work. And we found really strong pathways for sustainable ongoing operations, the, the most difficult thing for us to aim for. And the honorable minister from Nigeria will be telling us some information about that. So there's a huge amount of untapped value just waiting to be unleashed by fully scaling up these insights about leveraging core spatial data for health delivery. Thank you. So I'm now going to turn it over to Heather Chamberlain, um, who I've been really, really pleased to work with the last four years. She is um, at WorldPOP, where she does work on GIS and remote sensing and is a vital part of the population modeling team there. I'll turn over to you, Heather. Thanks, Mark, for the introduction. Um, so I'm going to be uh, talking about uh, how we integrated some of these geospatial data products, some of the core um, products that Mark had mentioned. So looking at uh, high resolution population data, um, settlement locations and extents, subnational boundaries, and also some infrastructure mapping and how those can uh, contribute to effective health campaign um, planning. So we could have the uh, slide back something. So focusing first um, on the high resolution population data. So um, these are really key to effective health campaigns as we often uh, always need to know the, the number of um, the number of people in a location, and so through Grid Three, um, we focused on high resolution data 
in formats that can be used to gain really granular insights into where population is located, uh, both in settings where recent censuses have been conducted and where it hasn't been possible, um, or it's been many years since a census was last conducted. And the population data sets that Grid3 um, produce, um, uh, instead of uh, them, uh, it, uh, most people are, are commonly uh, aware of data sets of population associated with, for example, administrative units, um, but we've had a real focus on gridded data sets. Um, so this means that instead of having um, an estimate of population for an administrative unit, we have an estimate for a grid cell within a regular grid. Typically, this is about 100 meters by 100 meters in size. And there's an example shown at the bottom here. So each of those different colored um, squares have a, 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 a represent a, a population estimate with darker red colors um, indicating you know, higher values. And you can see the, the values um, actually shown for each of those grid cells. And this work um, to produce gridded data sets has been um, led by WorldPOP at the University of Southampton as part of the Grid3 project. And it's grown out of earlier work to estimate population in northern Nigeria uh, for, for polio elimination efforts that Mark mentioned, and um, some other work with uh, in Afghanistan, uh, where the last census was last national census was conducted in 1979. So trying to fill data gaps there. And the two main methods that we uh, uh, used within Grid3, and we're using the World Pop terminology here of top down and bottom up. And so top down, we have shown on the slide here on the left. Um, we mean taking counts of population per administrative unit, um, for example, from a recent census, and then spatially disaggregating these to provide an estimate of population per grid cell. Um, in contrast, the bottom-up uh, approach is um, typically, uh, we use this more in locations where there hasn't been a recent census. Um, and so this relies on instead counts of people in sampled locations. So a count of population within a, a small geographically defined area. And then we develop a custom statistical model to estimate population at the grid cell level, including for all of the unsampled locations um, throughout the country. So as part of um, Grid3, there's been, uh, so Grid3 has produced uh, top-down data sets um, in uh, Sierra Leone, Mozambique, and, and South Sudan, um, and bottom-up estimates in Zambia, Nigeria, Burkina Faso, and also parts of um, the Democratic Republic of Congo, with work ongoing in, in several other locations. And with the development of new data sets over the past few years, um, we've, um, we're increasingly improving the accuracy of the population estimates um, for example, with the availability of new building footprint data sets, that's meant we've been able to spatially constrain these top-down estimates to just locations within settlements, and um, so really improving the spatial accuracy there. And typically, the work to produce bottom-up population estimates has relied on custom um, micro-census surveys, so essentially uh, surveys where we have enumerated population within defined small survey locations, and Although these are cheaper than say, conducting an, a national census, there is um, still significant expense involved um, as with any uh, large scale survey. But um, in terms of innovations, we've also been working to try and reduce this reliance. So for, in Zambia, for example, um, we've worked with ZAMSTAT, the National Statistics Agency, um, to develop bottom-up modeled estimates um, based on routinely collected household survey and pilot census cartography data. So trying to utilize alternative sources there um, to, to, produce bottom, uh, to produce modeled estimates. And in Burkina Faso, um, working with the National Statistics and Demography Institute, we've developed um, bottom-up estimates for locations uh, where it wasn't possible to enumerate population during the recent census. So essentially filling in the gaps in the census there. In South Sudan, um, we've had our innovations with using top-down um, disaggregation but including estimates um, of population displacement uh, to account uh, for potential changes in, in, the, in the spatial distribution of population there. So although we have these two main methods, we're continually adapting um, and bringing in new data sets where those are available. And the gridded nature of these population estimates means that they can be integrated easily with other geospatial data sets. And this has particular relevance um, for health, effective health campaign planning um, when we combine this with administrative units and health unit boundaries um, and settlement expense. And I'm going to talk about this further uh, with the next slide. 
So thinking um, about these data in relation, particularly in relation to health campaign effectiveness, um, they do provide an option to estimate population at really at a, a range of spatial scales and often provide much more granular insights than we might um, traditionally get from uh, aerial unit based um, estimates. And so this flexibility is because of um, the way we can aggregate this data. So as I said, we've got estimates for each grid cell and by aggregate we mean we're summing up the grid cell values um, for uh, a specified area. And so firstly on the left we've got an example here, we can aggregate these um, grid cell values to subnational units. So if this is administrative units or health units, so catchment areas or, or health areas where these exist. Um, then in the center, we've got an example where if we integrate the settlement extent data sets that Grid3 produces, and these are derived from, um, from, uh, from building footprints uh, data sets. So uh, they provide an outline um, of uh, uh, settlements at a, at a range of scales. And so we can sum up the, uh, the population, the, the grid cells associated um, with those locations to provide an estimate of population for say, um, an individual settlement or a range of settlements, which we previously would be very difficult to do with um, aerial-based estimates. And thirdly, the gridded nature of the population estimates mean that we can also calculate uh, estimates of population for custom units. So if you can draw a boundary of um, the area you want to calculate uh, population within, um, then it is possible to calculate an estimate for that location. Um, so either you can draw a boundary or we can also do this for um, specified proximity or distance. So for example, we have um, two locations shown here um, in the Chinga province in, in Zambia with uh, two health uh, facilities and calculating the population that is within um, five kilometers distance of, of these point locations. So integrating the, um, the point locations available through uh, various infrastructure data sets. Um, and a, a custom distance enables um, new insights. And it isn't just infrastructure location, maybe the population that is in a certain distance of a river um, who may want to be prioritized for access um, where, where road networks um, may be very remote or, or impassable at certain times of year. And uh, sorry, can I have a brief? Yeah, thank you, Emily. And um, so finally, just um, focusing on the bottom up cost of these population estimates. So with the bottom up estimates, we're developing custom statistical models um, to estimate uh, the population in all grid cells based on these small survey um, locations. And in this case, um, this is done within a Bayesian framework. And so we end up with a, a posterior distribution of, uh, of, of estimated population. So rather than having a single value, and um, we actually have a full um, range of um, values. And then we estimate uh, the, 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 the mean value is the one most used. Um, but we could also calculate a range of values corresponding to a 95% credible interval. Um, and so this may be useful in some um, campaign settings um, to estimate what the possible range of um, that population is. And so you can see an example on the left, as well as a single value, we've also got the upper and lower credible interval to show. So working with these geospatial data and um, to calculate estimates of population for these different units generally requires some knowledge of GIS. And as you heard Mark mention, there's been um, a big focus with Grid3 to focus on um, geospatial capacity strengthening and training. But realistically, this won't reach all those that are involved in planning and delivering health campaigns. And so to try and reduce this barrier to data use, we've also developed um, an interface which um, enables a user to work with the grid of population data sets. And this is called WAPA Vision. Um, it provides um, an interface where you have the map in the center. So a user can pan and zoom around the map to explore the spatial distribution of population with these darker red colors indicating uh, grid cells with higher population counts. So we've got uh, part of uh, Zambia here with Lusaka and the, um, to, off to the left of center. Um, and so from the left, a user can specify a country data set from this panel. And as well as being able to then explore this spatial distribution in the map, um, the interface also allows a user to calculate a range of population estimates. So a user can click on the map to get the estimate for a particular point location, and they can draw a custom area like the one uh, shown in blue here. Um, or also a user can upload a, a, a polygon um, or a, a set of polygons. So um, uh, this could be uh, some administrative units or health catchments 
and these can be uploaded um, and then uh, estimates calculated. And this is for both the population total and we can do this with age and sex disaggregation as well, where those are available. And as I mentioned, um, for the bottom up estimates where we uh, have uh, a mean value of population, but also uh, a measure of statistical uncertainty. And so this is also shown, you can see here for Zambia on the top right for the area within uh, the blue. So we have uh, a, a range of values shown there. And also to maximize the uh, applicability uh, to users, then this is available uh, in four different languages so that the interface um, can really maximize uh, its accessibility to a, to a range of users. Uh, thank you. I'm handing back to Mark. Uh, thanks, Heather. So I'm going to turn it over to Nazir Halaru, who is uh, the Grid3 Nigeria country manager, uh, where he does everything except sleep, as far as I can tell. Uh, plays a vital role supporting the, the Nigeria National Secretariat um, of Grid3. And he's going to tell us about the experience within Nigeria of extending uh, core spatial data layers to multiple um, campaigns. Nazir. Thank you so much, Mac, uh, for the um, introduction. So in the next uh, five minutes or less, I'm going to walk you through uh, some of the efforts that we put in place in Nigeria in terms of digital micro planning. Um, so I will ask the um, yeah, just play that video, please, for a minute. Micro planning is very, very essential in terms of uh, planning or designing a strategy through which uh, the health workers will reach the different target population for that particular vaccines. The Grid 3 program developed uh, 774 GIS based maps uh, to support the COVID 19 uh, vaccinations in Nigeria. We have 774 local governments. And each local government has one big GIS maps in an A0 size paper. And then um, the health workers use those maps to uh, conduct their micro planning. GIS. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. Uh, so, um, as you can see uh, from the video, uh, in the beginning of COVID-19 outbreak in Nigeria, Grid 3 has worked uh, very closely with the Presidential Task Force on COVID-19 uh, to provide high-resolution geospatial data uh, in order to respond to the pandemic. Uh, this is through uh, epidemiological modeling. And building on that effort, uh, we use also, or we produce GIS-based maps, uh, as you can see in the video, uh, to help the micro-planning effort on how the uh, COVID-19 vaccines uh, are going to be distributed uh, in Nigeria. And this helped in terms of uh, overlaying the uh, greater population estimates uh, to determine the uh, different catchment areas for the COVID-19 vaccines. And this slide, uh, use of GIS word map for the development of catchment areas uh, for, the, uh, for daily implementation plans, as you can see. So um, to give a little background on this, uh, learning from the uh, polio eradication efforts, where geospatial data played a significant role in identifying missed communities, uh, Group 3 Nigeria uh, complemented this efforts with additional high resolution geospatial data set on population, uh, health facilities, administrative boundaries, as well as uh, other POIs in order to make this map possible or to make the measles map uh, possible and also to delineate different catchment areas 
uh, for the different uh, target population. And, and as you can see, uh, this is a word map of Askira word in uh, Askira Uba LJ in Borno State, uh, which has uh, automatically delineated one kilometer uh, buffers uh, through which the uh, through which they serve as vaccination posts, uh, for which um, measles campaigns are being uh, conducted. And um, it also presented additional uh, data layer of population estimate for the different uh, antigens uh, for which uh, the vaccines are going to be administered in those campaigns. And this include the measles, yellow fever, uh, as well as uh, meningitis. Next slide. So um, building on the effort of uh, this code your spatial data layers complemented by uh, the grid tree program, uh, we collaborated with Novelty uh, to come up with the geospatial micro planning toolkit. And this is a building on the strategy, on the reuse strategy to delineate different catchment areas uh, for routine immunization, as well as for um, other uh, program areas such as uh, uh, non, so that's polio and non-polio SI campaigns and other primary healthcare interventions. So in this case, it provides the opportunity for the local health workers to have access to the comprehensive uh, data layers for how they can reach uh, these different populations. And it also improves uh, service delivery and um, it provides the opportunity to conduct additional field data collection for areas that are potentially missed uh, so that those settlements and those facilities, uh, you know, will be included in their micro plans. And um, as you can see, it also provides an opportunity uh, to track uh, the completion of these micro plans uh, at the different administrative levels. So the national will track the state and the state will track the local government and the local government will track the words as well as the health facilities to ensure that uh, these micro plans are being uh, effectively uh, uh, completed and also adding the uh, different layers of the uh, population estimates. Next slide. Um, as you can see here also, uh, it provides the opportunity, like I mentioned, to delineate catchment areas. As we used to do before, uh, we print these uh, maps and then send them to the state. And along the line, we have a lot of issues around uh, data quality, data falsification, you know, as well as other factors that affect how microplans are being conducted. So this uh, just special microplanning toolkit is... Um, going to address all those technicalities and all those issues being faced by local health workers and they will determine the strategies for the different settlement based on exact distance uh, leveraging the real strategies of how immunization sessions are being conducted within two kilometers within two to five kilometers and above uh, five kilometers and the health workers also or the ri service providers you know will use the uh, population layer in order to estimate the different target population uh, for the different antigens, for routine immunization, for the polio and non-polio SIA campaigns, as well as other primary healthcare interventions. And they will also determine how these health facilities or how the settlements are going to be reached and also how this, or where are the locations of those zero dose children so that, uh, you know, uh, the health workers can effectively plan uh, or reaching them. It also presents an opportunity through which the health workers will print these maps, will print these maps in order to add them into their micro plants and um, to ensure that uh, it improves equity as well as coverage to ensure that no child is left behind. Thank you and over. Thank you, Nazir. Um, so now I'm going to pass it to Anna Winters, who is the CEO of Acros, uh, which was one of the, the leaders, leaders in using technology to design more effective health delivery systems as well as surveillance systems. Um, and she's got some interesting things to say about experience in Zambia. Anna. Great, thank you, Mark. And it really is a pleasure to be sitting here on the panel with everyone. So I appreciate the opportunity. So one of the things that I wanna speak about is really the exciting piece that I see in the rollout of GRID3 and how it's acting as a real springboard 
to scale much of the um, population models for uh, planning and for ensuring that the last mile is reached with you know, life-saving health interventions. And I'm gonna couch this in some of our work in Zambia, where we've done some collaboration, both with the Ministry of Health, but also grade three to plan for, and then to operationalize, to distribute these interventions to the last mile. Next slide, Emily. So let's start with uh, a little bit about malaria interventions. Um, more or less, there are two primary interventions that are being used uh, in many of the malaria countries, indoor residual spray and LLINs or long-lasting insecticide treated nets. And these are typically used in combination to achieve as close as possible 100% vector control and through what might be considered a mosaic approach. And when these malaria interventions are delivered, what we're finding is that the actual coverage is consistently low. There's a challenge in finding the structures, understanding what this denominator is, i.e. the true population. And if we can't understand where people are living, it's extremely challenging to get these interventions to those individuals. So in order to deliver this mosaic vector control approach or any real, really um, household or community-based intervention, an, an extensive planning process is necessary. And we touched a little bit, Nazir mentioned this, um, we, we need to understand the population uh, and we need to do this uh, in a regular way in order to deliver these interventions, i.e. IRS and LLINs. Next slide. So we work as the Ministry of Health, as well as Grid3 and other partners um, to really look at two objectives. First of all, we wanted to apply the Grid3 products to help us create both macro and micro planning maps for the delivery of IRS and LLINs. That was the first objective. The second objective is we wanted to really action these maps and these plans. We wanted to operationalize them and get them on the ground with a spatial intelligence platform to guide IRS delivery and to ensure that it was reaching this last mile. Next slide, please. So here is a, a map and that background there is resulting from the grid through product. Uh, you can see highlighted there in orange, that's Luapula province in Zambia. A Couple of important things to note about Luapula province. First of all, um, it's nearly 40% covered by water. So the mosquito uh, habitat is uh, extremely conducive. Uh, hence the malaria incidence is quite high. There's a large malaria burden in this area. Uh, it's also one of the, the poorest provinces in all of Zambia. And um, this grid three data helped us to identify some of these remote settlements uh, that were unconnected by primary road networks. So you can see circled in green, some of those small red dots, if you will. These are settlements that were less than 25 structures. Uh, these are settlements that were also targeted for LLINs, long-lasting insecticide treated nets, uh, more of an unreached situation, far from the road networks, uh, hence the managers of it and the planners determined to focus LLINs in those areas. Then you can see more of these peri-urban areas, more to the right of your screen. Uh, these were areas where the um, structures were more than 25, and we're targeted for indoor residual spray. So overall, the Grid3 product really helped to lay the, the population information down so that this planning process could happen in 116 districts in Zambia. And that's really where we worked closely with the Ministry of Health planning teams, as well as Grid3 to develop map templates, to create a, a training process to roll uh, planning of processes across these 116 districts. Next slide. You can see in this next picture here, some of the planning uh, processes uh, where we've got these paper-based maps. It really is a collaborative under process to understand where are these settlements and how are we going to plan based upon our resources for these various interventions. 
And then on to our second objective, to remember this was again to operationalize the data, to take those plans and to deliver them to the households, to the settlements through a platform called Reveal. Reveal is a spatial intelligence platform. Next slide, Emily. You can think of it, think of it as um, almost like a Google Maps to deliver a health intervention. So in this first stage is the setup stage we were, where we were taking various data products and bringing them into the Reveal platform. Here you can see the Grid3 data products were brought into Reveal to then initiate that planning process, again, understanding where are the target settlements and what resources do we have available, where will we be placing IRS versus LLI, LLINs. That plan is then moved into the mobile client, you can see in step three, and that client, that mobile phone, is put in the hands of field teams, IRS delivery, community health workers, to navigate to those settlements, to distribute those interventions, to capture data against households and communities, so we can really understand, have these houses and communities received these interventions? As those data are captured, they're pushed to a, a dashboard where we can monitor in near real time uh, the coverage and uh, aim to get to that impactful coverage, uh, that high coverage of intervention. Next slide. So a quick wrap up here. This was really exciting to us because we have the information between the Grid3 data product uh, combined with the reveal tool to understand where these interventions are actually going. We can now see are we achieving that plan. Uh, in the 14 districts where we piloted that combination of reveal and grid three, this was in Southern Province, Zambia, we saw that often these plans are not always achieved. So in this case, 59% of the structures that were targeted for IRS actually were visited. And of those visited structures, we saw a greater 51% uh, 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 were actually sprayed. So what's this telling us? It's telling us that yes, we have a plan and that's important, but now we need to also move to the second stage of ensuring that that plan is followed so that we can uh, achieve that high population coverage, which is then going to lead to, to uh, impact. Next slide. So a couple of takeaways. First of all, the Grid3 product has provided a, a solid settlement level population data. It's exciting to see how this is scaled um, and ha has really added power to reaching these last mile communities. We're excited to also look uh, further at how can this be scaled in combination with Reveal uh, uh, in order to take these plans to the ground to operational operationalize the delivery and to monitor true coverage. And with that, that's everything. Thanks so much to many of our collaborators. And again, thanks, Mark, for the opportunity. Yeah, thanks, Anna. So uh, good news and bad news. Good news is we are going to end with a fantastic speaker with a lot of interesting things to say. Um, the Honorable Minister Prince Clem from Budget and National Planning in Nigeria. Um, the bad news is that we will not have time to answer questions live on the panel. We will answer them on the chat and we will follow up um, electronically with you later. So let me turn it over to Prince Clem. Oh. Um, I will turn it over to Prince Clem. Um, who, in addition to serving as uh, State Minister for Budget and Planning in Nigeria, is co-chair of the Grid3 Nigeria Steering Committee. Um, I've really enjoyed my talks with him and look forward to hearing what he has to say now. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Mark. Uh, it was really a pleasure meeting uh, with you in uh, New York and having the chat that we, we, we did. Uh, I, I'd like to uh, just give some perspective uh, of Grid 3 as uh, uh, a government uh, leader in, uh, in Nigeria. Uh, for me, uh, Grid 3 is a unique data-driven uh, tool. Uh, it is an ev evidence-based, uh, 
and therefore provides uh, opportunities to countries uh, such as Nigeria to generate uh, high quality geospatial uh, information across a variety of sectors uh, hosted on a single uh, platform with uh, easy access by the public to help in planning and decision making. Also in my capacity as a co-chair of not only GRID3 but of the Open Government uh, Partnership, I know the value of making such an investment and commitments uh, in the principles of uh, open government and transparency. Uh, the program has paved the way uh, for how government at all levels make policy uh, decisions, uh, manage uh, resources, and enabling uh, planning. A, a while ago, uh, when Anna Winters uh, was uh, speaking, uh, she did mention that there's a need to know uh, where people are living. It's where you know where people are living and you know the vegetation, uh, the type of uh, livelihood there that you can actually uh, make uh, plans uh, for them. Like the case uh, of uh, Zambia that she gave with a malaria infested uh, area. So the program has paved the way for how government at all levels make uh, decisions. The increasing amounts of geospatial data in Nigeria presented through Degree 3 uh, methods, uh, coupled with a better understanding of its uh, use uh, cases, uh, present opportunities to drive uh, economic growth uh, by the government. It has also examined the potential uh, areas to create value uh, from private and public uh, uh, sectors use cases and the potential to enable an innovative geospatial ecosystem that uh, unlocks further growth and equity. Uh, like we, we discussed in, uh, in New York, uh, the, the application is getting a wider acceptability uh, uh, within uh, the government. And we like to continue to uh, use this approach uh, because government values it a lot. Uh, you find that there is a lot of unequal uh, distribution of facilities across the country or in some states or even within the local uh, governments. You find in some areas there is an over concentration of hospitals, whereas in, a, in, in, uh, in other areas you do not have hospitals uh, at all. So using such uh, uh, technology uh, it helps decision makers in the uh, exact location of facilities or for intervention uh, in, uh, in different areas where there are, where there are issues. Uh, again, like I did mention to you, uh, in the Ministry of Finance, Budget and National Planning, where we have the Department for Monitoring and Evaluation, uh, we have decided to also use uh, uh, Grid 3 as a way of monitoring uh, project specific uh, uh, work across the country. And what we are doing is uh, developing a mobile web uh, app uh, that uh, Nigerians can uh, download on their, on their phones. So that once Mr. President lays the budget before the National Assembly and it is approved and uh, uh, signed into law by Mr. President, we will get Nazis team and co uh, to layer the various uh, projects on the Nigerian map and uh, thereafter we have it downloaded on this uh, software which Nigerians can have uh, on, their, on their phones. And so rather than the M&A department of about 10 uh, monitoring over 30,000 projects, uh, we will have the privilege of having over 180 million Nigerians doing the monitoring uh, for us. So citizens get engaged in the process. They see the projects themselves. They can speak to uh, the quality of what is being done or, or what is not being done and uh, whether work is being done uh, or not. And uh, uh, one of the expectations is that citizens also can take uh, pictures of these uh, uh, projects and uh, uh, using the, the, the web app to send it to us uh, for, for further review. But GRID 3 gives the system some level of integrity. Integrity 
uh, from both sides. Uh, you, you want citizens to actually be reporting the, 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 the actual projects because it's, it's easy to go to a different project and complain that something uh, is not being done. But because of its just partial nature, that we have the latitude and longitude, uh, we will be able to know if someone was to lie or not. And in the same vein, from the side of government, that uh, credibility and integrity is also uh, built into it. So government has realized over the years that uh, there have been avoidable challenges in the primary healthcare uh, service area, uh, the provision across uh, the country, ranging from governance, service uh, delivery, monetary and evaluation. So the goal now is to announce all available resources and technologies, such as the one presented by uh, GRID3, to ensure that no one is left behind. Uh, those underserved communities are identified and uh, uh, reached. I, do I still have some, some time? No, I'm afraid that we've actually gone over time and I really hate to do this, but I do need to um, inform you that, that the panel is now coming to an end. Um, thank you very much for your remarks and to all the other panelists. Um, and we will respond to unanswered questions, um, you know, one way or another through the, the chat and through the organizers and any additional comments that uh, any of the panelists would like to make can also be shared that way. Thank you very much, Mark. I'm sorry that we had to cut you off. It was a fabulous session. Um, and uh, thank you on behalf of the MIT events team. It's been our pleasure to support you today. Um, as Chris mentioned in our opening plenary, please join us at our next networking session from 11 to 12. EDT. Um, we will be using AirMeet as the coalition's annual meeting networking platform. So go back to the platform, click on the networking session from the program tab um, and set up your AirMeet account to join. It only takes a few minutes and we look forward to seeing you there shortly. Thank you very much. Goodbye.